ready? Are you ready for this? <laughs> no, I'm not ready. Okay. Of course not. <laughs> I thought I was just going to walk through this story. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm Sandy Shepard with the Chulibusta Heritage Museum of the South Bay Historical Society, where we are in the exhibit roof. We no longer have to have the partition. We do have to keep our distance. And I want to remind all of our schools and patrons who come that we still have lots of boxes of magazines that were given away. This was um, a magazine that Southwestern College did, and they did a whole story about my mother. Can you believe they printed 5,000 of these? That's amazing. I am with Rudy Ramirez, uh, a beautiful Chula Vista person, and you've done so many wonderful things. We connected because of the love of history and preservation. Now, I know you have a future out there with other things, but in my meeting with you, Rudy, what I loved is the fact that we really have to think about preservation. So for me, preserving this Holocaust exhibit into a Holocaust museum is huge. And in our conversation that we had, I wanna make sure viewers understand that it's not just the Holocaust that's so important, but the fact that we have the Armenian genocide, other genocides, and my next work would be based on World War II, people that are still in Chula Vista or the South Bay. I'll need you to come forward. Please contact me via my email at sheller at cox.net. And what we wanna do is to expand on the exhibit by maybe 2025, which would be the 80 year anniversary of the World War II and Holocaust. It's wonderful having you as a guest. I have some questions for you. Right. First question, where are you from? Chula Vista. You were born in Chula Vista. I was not born in Chula Vista. I was born in Mexico City. Mm -hmm. But when I was born, I was my parents already lived in Chula Vista. They just took me there mm -hmm. to, to uh, to have me be, my, my grandparents, my grandmother was in Mexico City, mm -hmm. and my mother, the story is my mother wanted to be close to her mom, and uh, my dad was working two jobs, and so she needed help, and that was the story. So they took me to Mexico City, and I was born, and then they brought me right back. So, and I've been in Chula Vista ever since. What I want to know is, what what's your life about? What is it that you do, and what are your interests here in our wonderful South Bay? So I've been uh, busy with two things predominantly. Uh, my career and my business was in the metal fabrication. I was a, a steel ma manufacturing contractor. I did structural steel and miscellaneous metals here uh, in Chula Vista at my business. I did that for almost 30 years. Uh, I also uh, was elected to the city council in 2006 mm -hmm. and served two terms there on the city council and uh, been busy before then and since then on many civic activities. I served on the general plan update steering committee, Bayfront development advisory committee, board of ethics, a whole bunch of other different civic activities. And, uh, and I like to you know, keep myself busy in, in things community. Mm -hmm. For someone who's involved in community, we have a situation in this world right now where we have to figure out what it's going to take for people, all people to get along, that all lives matter, yes, black lives matter. Right now we've got situations with what's going on in Israel and, 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 and with Palestinians, and it really, really hurts me because to be here in, in a Holocaust exhibit and to be able to have the opportunity to promote peace, I feel like I need help. I yeah. really need help. And what I find is the help that I need will be the longevity of the exhibit. Like how much longer is it that I can have and how many more people can be touched. So my question to you, I would love your ideas on what it's gonna take to expand the space that we're in and to keep it permanent. Well, first of all, I wanna say thank you for bringing this, uh, this exhibit. It's very important. I think that one of the fundamental problems that we have across our country and in our society is that we don't really know very much or understand history. And every opportunity that we have to tell people really what transpired and to 
work as hard as we can to, to speak the truth about that um, is very important work. It's, I think, what, what gives us the tools to go forward and to do the things that we need to do, address the issues that we need to address in, in our society, not just in Chula Vista, but across the country. And so I know that you're doing uh, a lot of educational work here, bringing kids through that. That's exactly the kind of work um, that we need to do um, to make things better for everybody, to create the, the kind of understanding um, that we need to create so that um, so that we can get along and, and we can and we can move forward and we can address together the problems that we face that seem to be just getting bigger and bigger every day. So uh, we need to work with history and we need to and we need to remind us and to have to institutionalize in Chula Vista a permanent location where we have exhibits like this. Um, that, that remind us continuously. I think it's a wonderful project, something I'm very committed to doing. Mm -hmm. I think that we have lots of opportunities in many different areas of Chula Vista. Mm -hmm. We just need to take those opportunities when they emerge. Yeah. Um, uh, we haven't always been very good about that, and, uh, but it's something that we need to do. We need to be able to set aside space for these very important activities. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so I'm committed to doing that with you, absolutely. One of the things that I'm noticing is we're in a place where our farmland is so important. We're in a place where our valleys are so important when you think about Otay Valley. And then I think of all the different communities. When we spoke, when we first met, we were talking about the trains. And I really think that when it comes to history, that we have to have almost like, I hate the word tolerance, just so you know, but I love the word understanding and I love the word acceptance. So I really would love to see something that's an acceptance center or an understanding center so we can understand the different kinds of groups and people that brought Chula Vista to where it is. Where would we be without farmlands, especially in the 50s and 60s? Where would we be without the railroad that we had? And I really think that for our future, we have to understand and make sure that our students that are coming up you want to hear something scary, really scary? It's the people now that are in five years old, six years old, 10 years old, that are going to be our future leaders that we have to look up to. If we don't do our job in telling them about our history, who's going to tell them? Yeah. Oh, I agree 100%. And you know, I think that, that, that we're in a, uh, in a very important moment to begin to have this conversation because as we know, the world has changed so dramatically in the last 20 years with the internet, with the iPhone and so forth, mm -hmm. digital media. Um, people are beginning to rethink what is a library system? Yeah. What is a library system in a city like Chula Vista? Really, what are the components of it? Is it really just a place where we keep books? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe there's still much of that, but there's certainly opportunities to begin to explore other avenues and other things yes. that we need to teach you. That's why I love our Chula Vista Public Library. What Joy Watley has done, what uh, Edwin has done, what the mayor has done, what they've allowed us to do to get this off the ground was the huge thing. And even with COVID, we are open. This Chula Vista Heritage Museum inside the library is open. Come get a magazine, read about my mom, read about the other people that we're going to feature. So what we're gonna do is to take a tour. Before I forget, I heard something today that really made a lot of sense. Tell me what you think of this. And what it was is, first of all, well, let me finish my sentence. Um, to be a really strong person, you have to be able to have new beginnings, that you can stop what you're doing and begin again. You do it with apology. It allows you to change as a person. What's your take on that sentence? I, I agree with it. I think it's, it's um, to be able to pause and reflect uh, in an honest way um, in a lot of aspects of life, personally, you know, in your relationships, um, and, and, uh, and reassess mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, um, and start over in, in some case. Uh, I think it's a very important uh, skill and, and necessary, I think. I wonder what would have happened to have Adolf Hitler chose to rethink what he was doing and saying, excuse me, I want to rewind the tape and do a brand new beginning 
because to continue on this path and to have people following, honestly, it will never be accepted for me. But I always think back, if I were somebody like that, what would I do? And the reflection that I had today was how cool it would be to have a new beginning. The other thing that reflected when we were talking, you had a steel company. Does steel bend? Yes. To a certain point. Yeah, it, it bends incredibly. I mean, it, it depends on the piece, it depends right. on the steel. And the hotter you get? The hotter you get, the, the easier it is. It is to bend. Yeah. So we, as humans, I feel, are the same way, that we have breaking points when we're at a certain point, almost like a piece of steel. And sometimes what we do is we get this heat within us. Sometimes we almost feel like we have to explode in order for us to change our ways. What's a, so what a beautiful metaphor. I can, Love that. I can relate to your piece of steel. <laughs> anyway, what we're gonna do is take a little bit of a tour. Are you ready I'd, for I'd it? I'd love to, yes, I'm very Great. excited. Let's Thank do. you. So the first thing I wanna show you is right here. And what this is, is a piece of artwork. And this was done by Rich Walker. And what he does is he sets the tone to our exhibit. And what this is, it says Rose Above the Ash. And it reflects on the Holocaust survivors that perished in the Holocaust. The other artwork that we have is called Time Destroyed, Life Taken. And if you look at this, you can see that it's a great reflection of a concentration camp that you don't know what day it is, what time it is, where you're going, when you're going, and how things are going to be. And again, it sets the tone before the students even come into the exhibit. You just kind of have to sit and take it in a little bit, yeah. don't you? Things take time. Things take a lot of time. And especially when we go through the exhibit, it's, it's pretty crazy there. You'll see what I mean. The first case that I'm showing you, if you look carefully, it shows what is an Aryan. It shows a typical phone that would have been used that maybe Hitler would have used. His book, Mein Kampf, over on this wall, there was a beauty contest as to who was the most beautiful Aryan baby. And would you believe that Goebbels chose a Jewish girl? Oh. <laughs> She's still alive today. And you could see the map of the concentration camps. And what you have over here is Nazi propaganda. If you look carefully, you could see even what Dr. Seuss did. And you could see that this was a children's book called The Poisonous Mushrooms, depicting what a Jewish child looked like and what Jewish people were. This was about in 1943. And down here is a typical, typical view of the bad Jew. He was the one that started the war. Yeah, right. I have a hard time with that. The second case that we have is a picture of my mom, a very spoiled woman. And if you look at where she lived here in Czechoslovakia, this has all been destroyed. So when they came home, they came home to nothing. So it's one thing to be in concentration camp, number one, number two, number three. Then you go to a liberation camp and then you come home to nothing. Now, the only photograph I have of Solomon Schlosser is right here because some people were not fortunate enough to have families that saved photographs. These documents right here are original Nazi photographs and they were given to me because when they knew that I was doing the exhibit, they said, uh, we can sleep better knowing that they're in exhibit instead of in our home. The people that I feature in the exhibit are 12. There's actually 13 that I located who were in the Holocaust and then settled in the South Bay. Oh. So these are people that were in different camps and um, some of them have passed, unfortunately. Um, How many are still here? The ones that are still here would be Renee Haber, who's the second photograph, mm -hmm. Lily, who's the third, Bella Mark, who's the fourth, he's about 97, 98. My father passed, my mother passed, Paul Schauder passed. Ona is still alive, but she wasn't in the Holocaust. I have her here for a particular reason. Sid Wapner, Ursula is alive, Max passed, and Solomon Schlosser just passed recently. 
in this exhibit, you can see what my mother wore two days before going in the Holocaust. And the biggest regret was that when she came home, she really, a 16 year old missed her boots. So my grandfather, first thing he did with the money that he saved was replace her boots. So those are her boots. Those are her boots. Yeah, those are her boots. And these are documents. You can see that anything with red marks somebody that says Jew. They did the same thing over here with my father's passport. And because they threw him out of Austria, you can see all the swastikas that were in his passport. Mm -hmm. And these are all your photographs? photographs of the Those are photographs that I have acquired that I did in my research and that all of the other Holocaust survivors were kind enough to give me. Solomon Schlosser wrote a book. He wrote a children's book. There are 53,000 copies that were distributed in Mexico. And then you could see a picture of my grandfather with his tattoo. And if you look at this thing, this little white box, uh -huh. what do you think that white box and thing is hanging in there? It's a tooth. Yes, my grandmother had to break her own tooth out because it had a string of gold in there. Uh -huh. And she had to hide it in the hem of her dress. Otherwise, they could have killed her for that. They would have taken her. Yeah, they, they took wedding rings, too. they took your shoes, they took eyeglasses, they took anything that they could possibly can. Um, this particular thing, I really love talking about. I think I'm the only Holocaust survivor who can do this. Yeah. I've got two issues that I can talk about. The woman that you see here is Gertrude Heise. She was a Nazi guard who pointed a gun and tried to kill my grandmother. She's still alive today. Wow. Yeah. We follow her. We're following. We know she has Alzheimer's. How, how but did she, well, I was going to say, how did she escape prosecution? She did. She did some years. And what you're looking at here is this was given to me a week before the exhibit came up. And if you look at this, it'll explain everything about her. In fact, I'll let you help me open this up, if you don't mind, Rudy. And this is... This was translated for me in English, but if you look at her back pages right here, okay, and I love when the kids look at this. This is written in German. It's her testimony, but if you look at the front page, just if we just drop the whole thing and you read the front page, I did a synopsis for you. So it's like, notice how many camps Gertrude went into. She admitted hitting inmates. She worked in a children's garden. Uh, what was she growing in the garden? Okay, food, there wasn't food. It was just water and powder. Ruth remembers the three stripes that she wore. Each stripe represented a thousand people killed. Ruth believes that those stripes were earned by gassing. On page three, Gertrude details that she witnessed a prisoner getting hit. On page four, the general conditions in Auschwitz were bad. On page five, she admitted that she had beaten inmates. So that's what's in that document. That was given to me. So, by, she, so she served a, a prison term? She served this? a prison term, but a very short prison term, not the term that she should have done. And now there are people in Germany that are going after women war criminals and they brought it to my attention that she is on that list. And if you look at this particular document underneath her photograph, that allows her to carry a gun and to murder people, okay? This one is a picture of my father who escaped. What happened is that he fled. Is that your father in the middle there and standing with a tie? No, he's the one playing the accordion. Oh, okay. Okay. And what happened is that um, he was thrown out at the age of 16 uh -huh. when he came to, um, he went to Northern Italy. And then from there, he went to the United States. They're on a ship there. Yeah, they're on a ship coming over. Okay. Kurt Sachs, age 16, set sail to America on oh, September. Okay. Yeah. So the, the exhibit has everything in English and then it has it in Spanish. So that's what the exhibit has. I'll make that a little bigger next go around. And this was just given to me by Nature Farms in Pahrump. They actually had a real true blue Nazi helmet. So people to this day are still donating to the exhibit, which is really incredible. I imagine so. People Even things like the headphones that somebody had. If you look here, here's Paul Schauder and his mother who were on a ship. They had escaped, but if you look over here, you can see that I'm just running out of room and that I have my mother's documents. Yeah. You can see the artwork that she did. And then over here is a wall of 
Bella and his twin brother. And you can see one of the documents from Paul Schauder. This particular case right over here talks about the Armenian genocide. And we were really lucky to have Summer Stefan tell us about what happened. And also Jill Galvez is Armenian. And she was kind enough to give us some of the things that, um, the documents that we needed to put this case together. I'm so sorry this case is so small, but I'm just blessed with what we have to work with. Mm -hmm. um, vanity is a big thing. And for people in the concentration camp, they took anything that they could to make any kind of bra or anything to, to keep their vanity sure. and make them look good. So you can see one that my mother made right here. Yeah, and then if you look at this particular item right here, it looks like something you would throw away in a thrift store, mm -hmm. right? But here, if you look at it, you can see it was the hat that my mother wore when she got married. Interesting. Yes. Uh-huh. And then these are the other Holocaust survivors. I love this one. This is a Paul Schauder where it shows the day that he got married and mm -hmm. as he got older. Mm -hmm. This particular case is really interesting. Here in Chula Vista, we had two people. Did you ever know Jack Yuffie? the Yuffie family no, in San Ysidro. Well, there was Jack Yuffie and his brother, Oscar. And at, when they were about a year old, Jack and Oscar were separated because of their parents' divorce. Mm -hmm. The mother went back to Europe. The father came with his son to Chula Vista. Oscar was in the Nazi youth. That's where she, that's how the mother hid him in the, in the Nazi youth, even though oh. he's Jewish, right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Then, Interesting, good strategy. Then in the 50s, right, what happened was the two guys got together. Uh, could they speak? Well, one spoke Yiddish, one spoke German, so they were able to communicate. And although their beliefs were different, uh, you could see that they're still very much the same in the way they look. So did it affect his beliefs, being in a Nazi youth? Of course it did, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You just believe, you but, just he knew, but did he know the truth about himself? I think so, yeah. I'm sure he knew. I'm sure after, you know, but when you're a youth and this is how you've been raised. Right. Yeah. It's kind of hard to unwind. It's, kind of, it's very hard to unwind. Uh, this particular person, this is Ursula Izraelski. She's one of our library volunteers. And what's really interesting is that when somebody goes, well, what camp? You have to be in a camp to be in the Holocaust. No, 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 no. She was in hiding and she was very badly treated. And one of the things that she did, she was actually a ballerina. She learned ballet. Somebody in the home that she lived in had a pair of ballet shoes. And when she put them on, she put all of her, her energy into becoming a dancer. And she's a volunteer. She's 85 years old and she's a volunteer here at the library. Um, what I love about this case is the fact that all these students love drawing and giving us pictures and thank you notes and all this good stuff. And how far can a Holocaust survivor go? Well, she speaks in the elementary schools. She speaks to the military. She spoke to different agents, ICE agents, border so agents, important. being yeah, honored work. by Ben Hueso, including mm -hmm. even getting an honorary degree from Southwestern College. And here she was 90 years old. And talking to kids was the most important thing she could do. What you're looking at now is that my mother traded in her drugs for hugs. And this was a big thing for her as she got older. She really found a purpose in her life. So this was really huge. Two so weeks this before, is really important work that you're doing because as this generation mm -hmm. goes away, you know, it starts passing. I mean, there's very few of them left. Well, Someone you, needs to continue to tell the story. And you're going to help me with this, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> this is the livelihood of the Holocaust survivors. My mother and father owned a grocery store, and then my father became a, a uh, stockbroker. In case of the Weinstock family, would you believe that Mr. Weinstock came from uh, Europe, from Poland, to Mexico? In Mexico, he sold mismatched shoes. From there, he got into the furniture business, right, and became a very, very well-to-do businessman here in the United States. His love for Israel was really huge. He was a major donor and supporter of our synagogue, which we'll go to in the next case. Here's a little puzzle. So my mother didn't have enough money to go to Mr. Weinstock's, you know, to, to get a nice dress, to go to one of his um, uh, honorings when he was honored. So she went to Sid's Fabric Store, oh, as yeah, you can see, Sid's fabric. fabric Store. And what happened is he's a Holocaust survivor. He had a number also. And my mother bought the fabric and made the dress that she wore when she was photographed in one of her first articles, which was right here. 
And yes, I love the sound of people in the library, so let them do what they need to do. Uh, this is a case about Temple Beth Shalom. You asked about the synagogue, and this was like back in the 50s when Temple Beth Shalom started. And to this day, it hasn't changed much. I know that they welcome people coming there. And um, Eddie Fischoff is somebody whose father was in the Holocaust. He lost an eye in Auschwitz. And Eddie is very, very instrumental in helping keeping uh, Temple Beth Shalom alive. What I did in this case is just talk about what are the different items that Jewish people have? What are the things, the fact that they have menorahs and yarmulkes and Shabbos candles and what, what do we do with challah and all that good stuff? So that's what this case is about and I'll let our viewers look at that. This to me is probably one of the most important cases that we have and this is my case of fame. We were very close to Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl saved my grandmother uh, by putting her in a mental home after the concentration camp, but put her in the American zone. And every year when he would come over, he would do uh, drawings and for our family. So this year, we're featuring in our Comic-Con, which is our Art in the Holocaust, we'll be featuring Viktor Frankl with Alex Vesely, who's Viktor's grandson. And we're so lucky to have the uh, talk there. Um, Ike Eisenhower, as we know, landed his, his helicopter at the San Diego Country That's Club. Right. We have a memorial for that him. That is correct. Hall, yeah. Absolutely. And if it wasn't for him, he's the one who used the four-letter word, said, you better document this. You know what? Because if we don't get it documented, no one will ever think that it happened. And then here's a beautiful poem that um, Lily Hecht's daughters wrote about her mother, why she liked to wear polka dots. Over here, we're very, very close to the Bronner family because the Bronners were kind enough to give our uh, first responders and police uh, the soap. And his father, Dr. Bronner's father was in the Holocaust. And here's something that somebody showed me in a film about Dr. Bronner, that somebody took a bucket of pee and dumped it on his head because he was Jewish. And here we have Renee Haber with her daughter, and you're wondering what those drumsticks are? Well, yeah. that's because uh, Renee's grandson is the drummer in Nine Inch Nails. Oh, wow. Isn't that fun? Yeah. And then do you remember the butcher shop called yes, the, Bar or the Butcher of Seville? And so he escaped, just like my father did. Mm -hmm. And always such a friendly guy with a joke. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And my mother was always given pearls because we had a relative, uh, the Krakauer family, who they went to Shanghai. They uh, got involved in the pearl industry. And here's my mother coming out of the Holocaust and within months she's wearing these beautiful pearls. Mm -hmm. Makes no sense. Um, these are my cousins, Kitty and Eva Bruna Over with their brother and they were killed in Auschwitz, oh, mm -hmm. but all of her artwork was saved and believe it or not, they made a postage stamp that came out in 1960 and it That's even Polish, talks about... So it gives people time to read about yeah. the camps. In Chula Vista, we have a uh, grocery store called Sprouts. Mm -hmm. And Ron Cohen's aunt was in the Holocaust. Imagine she lived in Nebraska, of all things. You know that Ron Cohen saved Christmas yes, in Chula Vista. Yes, he certainly did. <laughs> he is, and that's what it's supposed to be like. That is exactly, Rudy, what we need to do is to understand everybody's heritage, everybody's beliefs, that's exactly what we need to be doing. Here, if you look very carefully, is a very small picture of my mother three months coming out of the concentration camp with her friend. Mm -hmm. And here they are 70 years later wow. in a delicatessen. Uh -huh. And uh, so anyway, this Amazing. is what they people... Stay together. Or yeah. Or find each other. Yeah. yeah. So this is what people have to look forward to here in it's our a great museum. You've done a wonderful you job. You can see we've had some great people who've donated. I can see, yeah. We are so thankful to our donors. As you can see, you've seen a little bit of our exhibit. Uh -huh. I hope you've enjoyed it. I do. And we say to our viewers, thanks for watching. <laughs> Thank you for showing me around. I appreciate this.